Ipsy leads the way. Ipsy. One system personnel and pay. Ipsy. Hi, everyone, and thank you for joining us for the Ipsy podcast, where we give you updates on what's going on with the program. I'm Colonel Rebecca Eggers, the Functional Management Division Chief. And today I'm joined by Lieutenant Colonel Lee Backlars, uh, the deputy for our build, test, and capability support, um, and Major Mercedes Skidmore, who is our training lead. Welcome to you two. Thanks, ma'am. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, really look forward to engaging with some good questions and uh, getting some good information out to the field. Thank you, ma'am. Excited for the conversation today. Yeah, I'm, I'm really glad that both of you could join us today. So I want to start by saying I really appreciate everyone's patience and re- resilience as we navigate Release 3 now that it's live. Um, though it may not always feel like it, we're definitely making progress. And to date, we've had over 600,000 users that have logged into IPSA, and we average almost 100,000 users per day. We've really tried to focus our attention on, you know, stabilizing the system, you know, what's causing us issues with performance that we need to correct. Um, And then also for the field, really getting after accountability. So is everybody in the right place and the right component as we work through, you know, really trying to get our end strength correct and and allow us to get proper strength management to the the lowest user. And, you know, we've said it before because it's true, launching release three is really just the beginning. And um, while we're looking down the road and planning for our next iterations, we're also focused on areas that we need to address right now. So the team members have been working around the clock on the issues from the field and weekends and holidays ain't got nothing on us. But uh, Lee, can you give us a, a little update on what are some of the most important things that the team's been focusing on? Yeah, yes, ma'am. I'm going to bucket this into uh, three different kind of big areas. The first being kind of our conversion sources and just getting our data in a, in a place where we can actually see kind of what was going on before these different conversions, between these different conversion sources. So, you know, from a big picture, you know, from HR data perspective, we converted data from release two for the Army National Guard, TAP TBR for most of the reserve, and then uh, EMILPO and TOPMIS for our active component officer and enlisted force. However, you know, it, it's a lot more complicated than, than that, than just pulling that those systems in and just landing the data in, in a bunch of tables and then, you know, turning a system on. So there's a lot of logic tied to, you know, if, then that, then this, then do this uh, type stuff. And, and quite frankly, out the gate, uh, we noticed, and they're still battling some issues with some of our conversion sources, just not saying the same information for backlars, right? So Thomas would have had something different than have DBR did, and situations like that caused, you know, issues on soldier records. So I think we, you know, deployed our latest uh, fix of, of those type of issues, a lot to do with our soldiers who executed component transfers throughout their career. We've gotten a lot of CRM tickets on that. And, and just as a discrete example, many of these soldiers showed up on day one of Go Live with an assignment start date from when they entered the Army. So we had assignment start dates going all the way back to, you know, 1997 or even before then. So we, we did a concerted effort fixing that. And, and again, a lot of that has to do with just finally seeing our, our data from all different sources in one and, and getting it fixed. Kind of an, an emotional event for those folks that were going through it, and we worked pretty diligently to get those addressed as quickly as possible. And I think, you know, if I had to predict the future, I think we'll be, you know, normalizing our data in IPSA probably for the next, you know, six months or so as we kind of uncover some additional issues kind of tied to that and getting everybody's data normalized in the system. The PRRs and the PAI will go a long way to building um, the to-do list to get those right. But I think that's kind of the first bucket. Um, The second bucket is really the assignments. You know, the the assignments module in IPSA probably drives, you know, close to 80% of the business processes in IPSA, whether it's the promotion assignment match, which is for our compo two and three promotion processes to just normal PCS slotting to bring in folks onto title 10 type assignment and benefits. It really drives about 80 percent of the system so i think for the assignments section three kind of ticker tape items first is the backlog of boco assignments and we've been working diligently with with hrc in the field through those so that covers everything from iet accessions to pcs assignments that needed to be sent to ipsa as a pca 
reassignment versus a PCS, and those were for all PCS assignments that were sent via RFO or assignment instruction before BOCO. And so really working through that, again, that, that goes a long way with making sure our PAIs are as accurate as possible. Uh, the next is the slotting tool, which is more of a, you know, down at the user level, you know, kind of bread and butter of moving folks from one position to the other and doing that efficiently. And we saw a lot of issues with that uh, when we went live for the first, you know, I would say probably 60 days or so. I think we cleaned up kind of the last big bucket defect known to that slotting tool about a week and a half ago. There's a few couple things we have to clean up as well that we're tracking, the team is tracking. However, most of those actions can be performed in the assignments module itself versus a slotting tool. So we think we have some of that covered. But um, we, we noticed a lot of positions not available when they should have been, the position inquiry report not functioning the way uh, we had originally expected. So we really did some work over the last couple of months fixing that. The last thing I'll talk about assignments, and this really relates to things that we didn't see in tests, and one of those was uh, future approved assignments and then the impacts that that caused when the unit was trying to reassign them, right? So if if I had a PCS assignment that was approved in the system out six months with a report date six months in the future, um, my unit cannot conduct a reassignment on me in between that time, which obviously that happens quite a bit in the Army. Folks move around quite a bit. Uh, folks are moved within their battalions or through their brigades quite a bit before they actually go on their next PCS. So we have that noted as a critical change that needs to get done, and we're projected to get that done in the next month and a half or so. The third big bucket is really our uh, data exchange with the Defense Manpower Data Center, DMDC, which is a DOD level interface, and it sends data really all throughout the greater DOD enterprise. So DEERS gets data from there, your GAL, your Mill Connect, and even DJMS gets personnel data from soldiers that we send to DMDC. So uh, kind of tying back to my first point about our conversion sources not always being in sync. So when that converted data landed in Ipse and it was a little bit off, we ended up sending data to DMDC that wasn't really the truth for that soldier, right? So we had um, the first couple of months, several instances of uh, TRICARE benefits for our Compo 2 and 3 soldiers being erroneously uh, terminated. And we worked with DHA and DMDC to roll to roll back that coverage. But again, pretty significant emotional event for those soldiers impacted. And we did our due diligence to contact each one of those with the resolution approach and really help people through there. But that's the real impact of data and what it means for families. So again, we, we've taken a fair bit of time over the last couple of months really honing in what the logic tied to the data we send and really fixing some of our logic and then working with our our stakeholders to make sure we've got a good seamless resolution process uh, which which has been executed uh, when these when these things occur to rightfully reset records to the proper state that they're supposed to be in so from my vantage point ma'am those are kind of the big the big three that we've been working since we've gone live yeah Leah, i really I have to agree with you. Those are definitely the three big issues, um, you know, that we have going on. And and I don't know that the field really understands completely about, you know, where we are and some of the struggles that we're having and, and really what caused them. So ideally, we would not be still catching up on brownout and cutover transactions. You know, the the plan was always to have those done before you turned on any, you know, future, you know, PCSs and, and things like that. And so, you know, some of the struggles that we had with access requests when we started really delayed some of the ability to to get assignments and get people on assignment in a timely manner. And then, you know, HRC being able to push those assignments, that delay is kind of create a, a bit of a perfect storm for us. And I'm not sure that the that the field really kind of sees, hey, this isn't necessarily a, a issue or a problem or a situation that we're going to see ourselves in continuously um, once we get you know, everybody in the right spot, which, you know, the assignments piece, I think, comes to light because it really draws out, you know, hey, even though we did all of this testing, there are still some things that we didn't we didn't see. Um, but it's it's really it's really helped us narrow down where we need to fix things so we can get accountability of folks. And then, yeah, you mentioned DMDC and that tied to the conversion, certainly a big um, a big deal for us. And that you know, really how all this ties together, being able to transition folks from one 
one component to the next. What does it do to their benefits? Um, if someone doesn't do the right transaction or creates a separation rather than a transfer, it certainly has much bigger impacts than before when our when our systems were stovepipe. So I really appreciate you bringing those up because they're certainly near and dear to our heart here at the program. And then, you know, just a couple more things from, you know, really a more soldier point of view. You know, we have a lot of updates that we make to the system. Um, new new things come out. You know, we just heard about the new ACFT and, you know, we're still implementing the ACFT for promotion points. And then, you know, we've got new congressional and regulatory policy things that come out. You know, the recruiting ribbon is a is a one that just came out and the reproductive health absences, new parental leave policies. Um, what do we do here at the program to really react to those changes in regulation and policy and, and law? Yes, ma'am. You, you definitely mentioned a few right off the top there. So, you know, first and foremost is just staying connected with with our stakeholders across the enterprise. So for promotions, that's really with DMPM and promotions branch at HRC. So we work really closely with those. We we get kind of read aheads on what's coming down the pike and, and working with those folks on what business rule updates are needed. I think the ACFT is kind of a, an example of one that we we had quite a bit of lead time. Uh, we knew it was coming. And and for those, we, we work with the team to identify, you know, what changes are needed, where should we expose the the data? Where is it coming from? You know, it's, it's the same source as our APFT information is coming from. And then what rules need to be associated with it? What's the calculation for promotion points? How often do we need to run it? All of those kind of things. And we wrap those up into an engineering change request for what the software and business rules uh, that we expect to occur. And so we'll roll those out at the end of this month and, uh, you know, really ready for the receipt of ACFT scores from an official standpoint from ATMS starting on 1 April. And then I believe the calculation of those is is 1 June, if, if I have the date correctly. So a good example of kind of lots of lead time and, and getting that done. We also react to contact. So the parental leave, reproductive health, uh, those are two good examples. Again, just staying in contact with with our key folks. And as soon as those approvals were made, uh, we executed a written ECR immediately. And those get prioritized at the top based on the fact that they're LRP. I think DD-93, right? So that just changed literally, I think, a week ago. So that's another example of another update that'll be in the system and then working with our stakeholders as well as to what the interim guidance will be and and helping to uh, message that whatever milpers come out. Yeah, thanks, Lee. That's great information. And and for those listening, you know, we have an entire team on hand to work through um, not just the issues, but also some of these new policy items that come up. So, you know, as you start to use the system more and you become more familiar with it, um, please continue to note the issues you're experiencing um, and create, you know, CRM tickets uh, that allow us to kind of see what's happening if, if it's not working correctly for you. Thanks, Lee. So let's talk about um, IPSA training opportunities. So Major Skidmore, you know, you're our, our, our training guru. So what kind of resources av- are available for users who want to become more proficient in IPSA? Um, and, and how do users and really S1s um, best take advantage of them? Thank you, ma'am. Well, there's a number of things. Right now, probably one of the best tools for tactile reinforcement is UPKs which can be reviewed over and over again, can give click-by-click instruction on maybe a wide screen and have the rest of your section click along in the OTE. Another is reference guides or job aids, which also give click-by-click instruction, but in a paper format, more in a visual reinforcement kind of structure. The key really is noticing patterns, right? And so we find that one off, there'll be certain questions about a function in IPSA, and that's fine. But really, what concerns us is a pattern of a function error or issue in IPSA, and then developing a way to convey that to our audience in, you know, tactile, visual, auditory learning. Um, right now, the team chats, OTSS, social media, the team channel, or the team is you know, reading all of it, taking it all in, 
denoting patterns, and then developing job aids and reference guides that focus users' effort on the material or the process that may be most helpful. Notably, in the upcoming self-service guide and the previously released job aids for things like OBIEE and absence requests and PRR and reinitiating a member's assignment elections, to name a few. Uh, these resources can be found on S1Net, uh, ipsay.army.mil, and ipsay.army.mil training aids. Um, announcements can be found on ipsay.army.mil and Facebook. Addition to that would be our webinars, which are really a not only a tactile reinforcement and a visual reinforcement and an auditory reinforcement, but it's engaging. Um, the user is able to ask us questions in real time and we're able to answer them and show them the screens that they need to be in. Each webinar has a different topic. Um, the upcoming webinars right now are the 27th of March at 11, that'll focus on audit and internal control. So maybe it's something that maybe a warrant from a certain echelon might be more interested in. But there's also focused webinars on patterns that we've seen develop out in the field. Uh, one of those most notably is the 29th of March, which will be all MPD focused. Yeah, so I think you bring up a good point. So we do have quite a bit of content out there. And you mentioned the UPKs, the user productivity kits. And I think what what's interesting is we get a lot of requests for step-by-step -step guides. You know, can someone point me to a step by or someone has someone created a step by step guide? Um, and I want to remind folks that, you know, one of the options in each one of those UPK is a printed option and it actually creates the steps um, so you can print them on where to go. And just just so folks have that or, you know, can provide that if people really want step by step, we're we really trying not to recreate things and guides and job aids where there are other options out there but um yeah i i completely understand where you're coming from we get a lot of requests for step-by-step -step guides um and and i want to make sure that the field knows hey there's there's something at their fingertips that that can probably help them and I, and i'm glad you mentioned social media we have the increased membership of our ipsafe closed facebook groups really quadrupled and it's a great place to receive peer-to-peer -peer support, um, discuss different processes. We do post some of those job aids out there and, and really provides options for best practices. And I can't stress enough how much the team's channels have really allowed us to connect directly to the field. I and mean, one of those is the virtual over-the-shoulder support um, that's been really helpful to the field. Can you can you just tell me what what's the future of the virtual OTSS? So unfortunately, we are going to be kind of downshifting that a little bit. Our team section, which are made up of some civilians and green suitors, um, have actively been holding live team channels for questions. Both CONUS and OCONUS times have been available. Channels in the IPSA go live cutover support. Um, there are nine channels and users can choose the applicable channel for them. But we're going to have to downshift that a little bit as we start to kind of off ramp some of our civilian population. So those those answers now and, and in the future will be handled by more of a green suitor population. Um, we might see those channels kind of collapse into more groups instead of individual subject matter. We're, we're really trying to find the best way to convey that virtually. Some of the in-person OTSSs that are currently scheduled are Cadet Command and West Point. Units may always request support by sending the training team the five W's and we'll assess some resources to come out and meet you face to face. The key here really is that, as you said earlier, there's so many resources available to help everyone usher into, you know, the newness of IPSA and its applicability. Yeah, I know that that engagement that we had with the OTSS is, you know, really was really fundamental to getting feedback really quickly, especially when the teams were traveling out to the field. And, you know, I, I tell senior leaders often in that, you know, IPSA is not an HR system. It really is a soldier system. So, you know, the feedback from soldiers is one of the things that's going to make this system better. So how does it how does it work best for them? What do they want to see for changes? Um, and we've really received quite a bit of constructive feedback from, you know, different avenues, mostly from HR professionals, because, you know, they're the ones that are 
in it most of the time, but we do want to continue to gather feedback from every level. Um, but, you know, most recently um, we made some changes to monitor approvals and almost instantaneously, you know, our Facebook groups and social media really had comments about what happened. How come I can't see what I'm supposed to be tracking? And I think it was a good litmus test for us. One that shows that, you know, the feedback loop is working. We're able to see those, you know, issues really quickly. And then, you know, based on the feedback that we received, we were able to quickly institute a a design change to reinstate some of that functionality. But I really wanted to get an idea on, you know, your engagement with not just HR professionals, but um, at the field level as well. Well, a number of questions are brought up during the in-person OTSS, which is great because it's an engagement of HR professionals, but also soldiers from different formations and different footprints. You're correct. The training team engages with soldiers on a daily basis. Um, We are seeing them in teams. We're receiving private messages on social media. We're monitoring chats of other functions or functional echelons, right? When they have their meetings and they're giving, they're imparting instruction, we're able to monitor their chats and answer questions from soldiers who may feel that their concern might not be a pattern, but it's still a concern that they have. And we've been able to turn that feedback into focusing our webinar content towards those patterns, which is great. You know, for every 10 people that have the same issue, our way of thinking here is that there's probably 200 people who have that problem. They just haven't found a an avenue to express that. We're asking them questions and getting their input, and it's really helpful. The level of feedback from our customers as well as our HR professionals. Um, and it's also giving us ideas of how to better create content, right, um, and better convey that content to the audience. Yeah, so we just kind of gather um, information from everywhere. What do you, what do you, if you had to tell a soldier right now, hey, if you have feedback, um, I know you guys are gathering it from all different places, but and you know trying to streamline it. But you know, what are the best ways for soldiers if they have recommendations? Uh, maybe not an issue, but a recommendation to kind of pass that to the team. Um, and then, what do you do with it? Well, recommendations can come through the group box. I would say that's probably the best way. Um, If they try to enter it through a chat, we're really looking for issues um, rather than, you know, improvements of the functionality or visual part of it, say. So, again, that email box is usarmy.pentagon.hqda.ipsay.mbx, ipsay at army.mil. Some other ways to get in contact with us is to contact our STRATCOM team. Uh, They're constantly getting feedback, what other personnel in the Army may think would be more suitable or a better visual, and that's always helpful. But yes, we collect a lot of feedback and we consolidate it, and we try to categorize it and analyze it based on whether or not it's a pattern or if it's a singular event. And then we try to kind of think about what kind of gaps they identify, right? Or, or is it a communication gap or is it a training gap? I would say those are probably the best ways. Yeah, thanks. That's really great information. And then I can't walk away from the mobile app. So, you know, one of the, one of the greatest features for soldiers, aside from simply being able to see your record, is really mobile accessibility. So, you know, not only can they watch Netflix and scroll through cat memes on their mobile devices, they can now access IPSA. And, you know, we're really encouraging people to access um, IPSA from their phones for the actions that they need. They can do it 24-7, just provides them a lot of opportunity. And we have seen the downloads of the app um, increase exponentially. Um, and then not only that, it's not just the download. We know we can see people are accessing IPSA through the app. So is there anything you want to hammer home um, to the audience about IPSA's mobile accessibility? Absolutely. You know, accessibility is key. And I think we've created that with the app. You know, most people's phones today are small computers. Why not use that to our advantage? And they spend an incredible amount of time staring at it, right? So um, making a self-initiated HR portal really was the next step. The app is convenient. There's no paperwork to misplace. And registering for a DS logon is really easy. Things that I would like to kind of bring home 
for applicability and accessibility would just be, there are a lot of things that the user can accomplish in the app, not only the user, but also leaders. And I think that we don't talk about that maybe as much. Our audience has definitely been kind of focused on the average everyday user, because that really does make up the largest population in the Army. And those personnel are able to, you know, submit absence requests, um, submit special pay requests, review their dependent or beneficiary information, look at their retirement points or their orders or calculate DOD compensation or even view or edit their user profile. They can also complete hands-on training while they're standing in line at the grocery store or, you know, review their board preferences if that's applicable to their particular component. You know, it, it really is accessibility and convenience is really the name of the game there. Unfortunately, the TAM Soldier Work Center is not functioning currently, but it is absolutely on our next rollout. In addition to that, because that's all self-service things, you know, leaders can approve transactions and the approval style on the app. And I think that that's a great point because leaders travel so much and there might be some distance or some physical distance between them and their formations. And it's absolutely incredible to be able to sign in on your government computer or your government app or your government phone or tablet and access your soldier members' transactions that affect their daily life and be able to get that back to them as soon as possible. Yeah, that's actually really key. So when we were um, initially going on our roadshow about IPSE, one of the things that we would talk about a lot is, you know, how do you keep commanders from being tied to their desks approving actions, you know? And we used to talk about, you know, Commanders driving to the field with, you know, the stack of blue folders that they had to, you know, all the actions they had to sign. And and essentially, we've we've really made that mobile or portable um, with the IPSA app because now, yeah, you can you can approve those actions while they're driving to the field on on their government device if need be. And then, you know, soldiers had a, a recently had a comment on our Facebook group about a soldier who's, you know, talking about the frequently asked questions that they get from soldiers, um, you know, where can I find my promotion points or, you know, how do I see my promotion points? And it's one of those things where uh, we truly need to teach soldiers now how to fish. I mean, it is, they've never had this much visibility of their record at their fingertips. Um, so I, I can't stress enough. I think you hit it, uh, hit it right on the mark. There is a tremendous amount of things they can do and see on their own personal record, which, um, you know, it's, it's how it, it should be, you know, we should be able to see what, what is in our records. Um, so it's really great. I'm glad you, uh, I'm glad you brought those up. So, whether it's your phone um, or a tablet or a desktop, I really encourage everyone to go into IPSA and explore. Um, you know, the system exists for you, um, the soldier, the HR professional, um, and the more familiar you're with it, the more you, the more that you'll get out of it. Um, and again, we have awesome resources on the IPSA website, like the, the user guide version six is out now to help you through it. So log in and check it out. And just one final note, remember our traveling over the shoulder support will continue through March 31st. We'll have virtual options be a little bit more scaled down, um, but we still will be able to make some limited visits, but we are here to support you. And that's it for this episode. Um, Thank you both for being here and thanks for listening. Um, Until next time, Ipsy is your system. Red soldier, right job, right on time. 24-7, 365.